Lord Minute, the Minimal Minute podcast for the 997 sequel Jurassic Park, one minute time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're here to discuss Minute 67 of The Lost World. David, we're uh, getting closer to a trailer coming out, but apparently there's some reshoots happening for Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. Yeah, there are. Well, first off, I just want to apologize to our listeners. I got a cold. So, uh, the state's time is the state's cold and flu season this time instead of Australia. Australia's getting <laughs> nice and warm. We're getting nice and cold. Yeah. So if I sound muffled, I apologize. But yeah, exciting, exciting news here. We got um, got some exciting news. Yeah. Yeah, there. Um, we don't know where exactly the reshoots are happening. Like real new, uh, real news would have. Um, picked up if they were back in Hawaii. Um, mm-hmm. It's mostly just some stuff in building in a studio. Um, yeah, my idea is that it's probably just going to be some quick pickup shots. It's not unusual at all. Yeah. For a uh, big production like this to have some quick pickup shots, shoot some B, extra B roll. They wanted to, they didn't get in. Shoot some extra, uh, reshoot some scenes that they didn't uh, weren't quite satisfied with at the end. Yeah. Uh, little things like that, nothing to, I'd really worry about. It's actually one of my favorite pickup shots that they reshot at the end, like very end, just like this in the first Jurassic World, was they did the shot that we got in Jurassic World of the goat outside the, uh, in or with, well, inside Paddock 9, outside the viewing area. Yes. So it was just like a quick, <clears throat> not even 30 second shot of the flare being thrown at a goat. And yeah, so, I, yeah, because I remember, I remember that we seen that photo was released. Like Colin tweeted or someone tweeted it was the second unit that was doing some pickup shots after yeah. the fact, and um, yeah, that really got us hot because it was the sort of the um, the redwood forest look, or just the big trees, and yeah, the return up, of the goat. Uh, yeah, they went up. They didn't go quite as far north as um, as the team did it as Spielberg did when he shot the lost world, but they went up pretty close to there. I don't I think it was around probably close to Eureka. Yep. That they shot that, uh, those scene or that scene, I should say. Yep. I suppose one of the other big ones that too, um, famously is the, uh, the shawarma scene from the end of the first Avengers. Um, that whole yeah. thing was filmed a lot later when, um, uh, Chris, which Chris is Captain America. <laughs> Chris, uh, He's one of the Chris's. Um, he actually, I want to say. Uh, like, is it Chris Pine or is he? Uh, no, no, it? that's Kirk. <laughs> yeah. Names uh, anyway, one of the it's Chris's. Like Chris P's in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, he'd actually start growing a mustache for uh, Uncle Snowpiercer, and um. He come back to reshoot and had to CG. I don't know if they CG it out or uh, what happened there, but um, when he was actually on set for that uh, shawarma scene, he actually had a moustache <laughs> and a beard. So, mm-hmm. but he couldn't he couldn't cut off because he was filming Snowpiercer. So, um, yeah, Chris Evans, I think that was his Evans. Name. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why we're not doing the Avengers minute or anything Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine the director on that, Joss Whedon, being like, "Hey, Chris," and both Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans <laughs> turning and be like, "What? Which one?" Oh, sure, they got to have some sort of nickname. <laughs> I'm sure. Cap and Hammer or something. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a bad '70s cop duo show. Yeah. <laughs> the Cap and the Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the Hulk and the Hammer for Ragnarok, so. Yeah. Uh, I think I should tell you guys. Hammond told me these people might show up. I thought we'd be finished by the time they got started, but in case they weren't, he did send a backup plan. What backup plan? Me. One other bit of news, too. We got a tweet out from Colin. Um, I think he was replying to a tweet from Biona and Jay Javonsky, Mm. 13. Um, Cherish the silence. It's about to get loud. The trailer's close. Mm -hmm. Um which I think it's now been announced that uh, December 1st will be the uh, trailer release. Yeah, it was announced by Jurassic Outpost. Yep. So that's definitely exciting. I hope yep. I hope it's a good trailer. I hope it's not just, um, like, lame shots that uh, don't really mean anything. I hope, But I also don't want it to be spoilery. 
I don't want it to give away the ending. I don't want it to give away the monster. I don't want it to give away, like, all the little things that we mean you know that we haven't talked about, the major spoilers. Mm. Yeah, leave us some fist-pumping moments <laughs> in, for the film. Um, yeah. I don't know. I definitely so, want a T-Rex. There's definitely got to be a T-Rex in yes. the money shot. Yep. Or even the raw, just... Um, yeah. Because, like, one thing sort of dipping back to Marvel again with Ragnarok having Hulk in all the trailers was probably one thing that they really shouldn't have done I hear people have seen it sort of that they build up in the film it's supposed to be this big triumphant moment that Hulk appears and we've seen it in the trailer so mm -hmm. there are some people that do avoid the trailers and good luck to those people and especially with Star Wars and stuff like that they just uh, media blackout leading up to <clears throat> the film's release so yeah, definitely. There's people out there who'll stick their fingers in their ears and cry la 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 la. <laughs> Star Wars, I know that for certain. Yeah, I've heard even with with Ragnarok, people were when the Star Wars trailer come on, they'd walk out, they're walking out of this theater for five minutes, waiting for it to pass, and come back in. So it's dedication. <laughs> Eighty percent female Greenpeace. Thanks. Noble. Yeah, well, Noble was last year. This year I'm getting paid. Hammers check cleared. I wouldn't be going on this wild goose chase. Uh, where you're going is the only place in the world where the geese chase you. Lastly, too, there's, um, <laughs> there's been some uh, rumours and rumblings going around on uh, different forums about uh, whether or not Chronicle has has much of a future. They've um, Apparently they've got a meeting with Universal on December 1st to discuss the licence because there's been some grumbles about Ironhead Studios getting some uh, piece of the pie as well and coming on board to produce... Uh, items for Jurassic World and for the franchise itself mm -hmm. when uh, Chronicle were under the impression that it was an exclusive license. Um, yeah, it was supposed to... I I heard that it was supposed to be from fans. I've heard that it's supposed to be either that it was 150 or 200 and up that uh, that Chronicle got the light, exclusive license for and then Mattel had everything that was... 150 down or something yep. or under 150 I want to say yep that would make sense with stuff like the Lego sets where the largest Lego set would be about 129 I think they are yeah they don't, they don't go over that 150 <clears throat> bracket but because we've had I suppose we haven't talked too we've had the um the teaser from them with um get the kids and a pair of black mm -hmm. black pants and black legs on a Jurassic Park pl uh, base plate which uh, yeah. is a little teaser to Ian Malcolm statue that they must be getting close to release. Well, we got the um, we got the convention down there in Brazil in December, so I'm I'm guessing that'll be on display there. Oh, uh, undoubtedly. Yep. And I suppose with some of the other stuff, I was browsing their uh, website last night, and a lot of um, like a lot of the Marvel helmets for Cap and uh, yeah, Cap and Four and. Um, Black Panther stuff like that, so you'd think night vision goggles would be right up with that sort of stuff as well, <clears> which <throat> which Chronicle have already sort of shown prototypes of theirs, so that's going to be a major a major clash there if if another company is allowed to do the same stuff. Yeah. Also, I heard that um, Chronicle was North America and everywhere, but Ironhead Studios was only South America. It, well, it didn't have a North America license or a Europe license or an Asia license. Oh, okay. So, I don't know um, if they'll really bump so much, but I do know that it would if they do have like a North America license, that um, that Chronicle would probably wouldn't be happy. Yeah. You no. Know? Yep. Yeah. And they've paid they've paid X amount of money for the license. Um, mm -hmm. They've got the team of designers, engineers sculptors they're doing the work they had a um facebook live video up a couple of days ago i think it's pretty much confirmed now that there will be no more human characters yeah. coming out of them um and the blue and owens possibly cancelled as well mm -hmm. with just no, a blue and owen i heard was you're still going forward with i thought oh, okay i thought they were just going to remove owen and just release it as a blue statue but i don't think that makes sense because they're already going with a blue statue with the um with the T-Rex uh, in blue versus Indominus diorama. Ah, oh, yeah, yep. Yeah, and there's, <laughs> they've, they've showed another Raptor too, Raptor Bust. I've got to get one of them. They mm -hmm. just look fantastic. 
Oh, they also, um, they announced, I believe they've discussed it before, but we haven't. They announced Raptors in the Kitchen, mm-hmm. and they said that they will be definitely finishing up, um, they, they're they going to have a Pachycephalosaurus maquette, I guess. Yes, I'd heard about that, which was interesting. Mm-hmm. I'd love to have a little Pachy. Which will be great. I wonder if they'll go for the the kind of tripod maquette pose that Stan Winston set up. Or if they'll do something more natural, where it's like the horizontal mm. view that we get in the film. As long as it doesn't have a spring-loaded head gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so December, normally come December, everything sort of dies down news-wise as the uh, holidays come in. But it's um, it's going to be busy. We've got the trailer, we've got the Comic-Con convention in South America, where uh, Ironhead's going to be displaying a lot of their... Um, first wave of Jurassic stuff they got released, so it's going to be a fun time. Can't wait. Burke, come here. You recognise this trackway? Yes, I do. Tyrannosaur. All right. Good to get into minute 67. Sure. All right. As we ended minute 66 of The Lost World, Bloodlow had found his hip flask and was telling the survivors that there was another problem with walking to the worker village. And that was the Velociraptors. As we start minute 67, Ludlow continues that their satellite infrareds showed the Velociraptor nests in the centre of the island, which is why the hunters planned on staying to the outer rim. At 66 minutes and 5 seconds, Dieter asks, what, what is that? A Velocir... Bert comes in and corrects him. Velociraptor. At 66 minutes and 17 seconds, Sarah says that the Rexes may continue to track them as well if they perceive a danger to themselves or their infant. The two go back and forth for some time until at 66 minutes and 37 seconds Ludlow takes a swig from his flask and says right this is all very thrilling but I say we push on to the village. At 66 minutes and 40 seconds Ian suggests heading back to the lagoon. Roland disagrees. Heading down there to wait for the captain is not a good idea. At 66 for minutes and 54 seconds, Roland walks over and picks his gun up off a stack of crates and says Rex just fed so he won't bother us for food. Malcolm leaves Kelly and walks forward in protest. Just fed? I assume you're talking about Eddie. The man saved our lives by giving his, so you should show us some respect. This ends minute 67 of The Lost World. Alright, last minute we had... Uh ended with Ludlow saying Voldemort's name and the eerie score starting to come up <laughs> or in this case mm-hmm. with this franchise the uh, Velociraptors um, mm-hmm. and it's sort of uh, from the pre senio script when um, Ludlow said if we can get to the village we can call for help and uh, Nick asks how far is it by foot um, Ludlow actually replies I said if we can get there um, it's a day's walk but that's not the problem and sort of leads into what the problem is which we are uh, get to here I love in the background too for this whole scene there's a hunter sort of stacking blue bags in a container they've got mm-hmm. a few of those plastic trunks military grade trunks lying there which is weird because when they start trekking later on no one's carrying trunks it's all backpacks so it's they're like they're they're assessing and rationing and seeing what sort of stuff they've got left and loading mm-hmm. these trunks up but they're not going to take them with them <laughs> mm-hmm now, something I like about this set here that they really didn't do with Jurassic Park 3 is that they kind of made it three-dimensional in a way. They didn't just end it. They just didn't end it with, like, a vine-covered set wall, so you couldn't really tell. They, it goes, there's layers to this shot here of Ludlow tell, explaining the why Velociraptors are bad. Yeah. There's Ludlow, then there's the guys working around in the background that we see carrying the blue bags. Then there's trees. And then you can see off in the distance there's more trees, and it almost looks like it looks like it's supposed to be a real jungle. It goes off into a distance, you know. Yeah, you'd um you would <clears throat> mistake it for not being a set. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Being a real location just because of the sheer size, and it was granted it was built larger for the earlier scene with the rampage where we needed the Gavrizzi and his team sort of looking down over the whole campsite. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've had different aspects of it, different parts of it, Nick and the uh, dinosaur cages, stuff like that, where 
we can see how big the actual set is and now they're making full use of that big set by being able to come back here as a group of survivors and being able to see deep and depth in the set. Um, and mm-hmm. as you said, just like Jurassic, uh, Jurassic Park 3 didn't because a lot of those interior shots, they may be on the same sets, but they weren't built as big um, and it was definitely more enclosed. Um, yeah. But uh, Ludlow sort of uh, comes back in here with our satellite infrared show. The nesting sites are in the island interior, which is why we plan to keep to the uh, outer rim, which is a good little good little bit of info here that they've actually they had the plan to um, to stay away from the island interior mm-hmm. with the um, with one of the original shooting scripts too, where uh, when Ludlow's in the tent discussing um, Jurassic Park San Diego, it's actually him and Burke are in the tent discussing um, where they're going to go to the following day and looking at some mm-hmm. nesting sites to say we might be able to get some infants um, or some eggs, which is sort of a little callback to the novel. Um, instead of having that whole investment speech and the trite coming through the tent at Ludlow, it comes through at Ludlow and Burke, which sort of... It just mm-hmm. gets Burke in the film a bit more, where he comes and goes a lot. Same with the other characters as well. But Dita cuts him off, holding up his uh, water canteen. What's that? Velocir and can't sort of say the name, sort of like Roland mm-hmm. not being able to say some of the dinosaur names, which, again, in the uh, pre Diego script, he did actually say Velociraptor. Um, he doesn't get the name wrong. Uh, Burke sort of gives the explanation. Velociraptor, carnivore, pack hunter, about two metres tall, long snout and binocular vision, dexterous forearms and killing claws on both feet. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a problem with what he says there, a number... For uh, like two things, I got a problem with one: the two meter tall. A uh, human isn't exactly two meters tall. He's at most one point eight meters tall. Yeah. And so, it you know if he was two meter, if a raptor was two meters tall, and I know they're estimating here, but everybody takes this as like a um, takes what Burke's saying here as like an absolution. Like it's the most like a raptor is two meters tall. It's not the Maquette that, or not the maquette, the animatronics that Stan Winston Tui has built were only like five and a half feet tall. So, yeah. And that's, yeah. It's, yeah, and it it sort of changes how the animal's standing too. Like, you sort of look at uh, when the raptors first enter the kitchen and they sort of stand right up and sort of that do that barking into the air while they're calling for the other mm-hmm. raptor. Like, it's probably gone from, um, five to six feet to seven seven and a half foot or something like just yeah putting its head up into the air and um just having that sort of extra reach up but yeah but uh, five feet i reckon five feet's a good size Mm -hmm. because especially these ones because they're sort of looking when we especially when we get to the village layer they're sort of at eye height of the humans yeah they're a little bit smaller than the jurassic park ones Yeah, and I'm about I I'm uh five eight, so I'd be looking at him in the eyes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But the other thing he says, speaking of the eyes, the other thing he says is that they have binocular vision. <laughs> the T Rex has binocular vision. If you look at the front of it, you'd be able to see both eyes. If you yeah. look at the front of a Velociraptor, you can't. Yeah. That's not binocular vision. Mm. It's like partial. It's like semi binocular vision, at most, and I'm probably being gratuitous there. Yeah, and it's probably a good thing they um he mentions killing claws on both feet because nothing really apart from carnivore sort of puts the uh puts the worry into people. Um, mm-hmm. No, we... but like Deinonychus, which the Jurassic Park Velociraptors are based off of, his name literally means terrible claw. Yeah. <clears throat> well, even even if he'd said Velociraptor, bird of prey, or Sort of, mm-hmm. it's it's not what its name meant, just to sort of make it sound more dangerous. We know what how dangerous it is. We cut to Ian holding Kelly still, and in the pre San Diego script, it was actually Doctor Judson that's explaining what the uh, raptor mm-hmm. is, because him and Burke seem to have some rivalry. Um, yeah, they do. Between each more other. More so than. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, more so than um, well, what we've seen before, and. We get Ian yeah. sort of lead Kelly away from the conversation in that script and whisper something to her before coming back to the group by himself. 
Um, and Dita unslings his weapon and says, I think we can handle ourselves against him. And as Malcolm returns, he says, no, I'm quite certain you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah sort of, <clears throat> and the Rex may continue to track us if they perceive a threat to them and their infant. Um, and then we get to start this little back and forth between her and Burke, where Burke's, no, you're wrong there, Dr. S- Dr. Harding. We'll, uh, we'll lose them once we leave the territory. And Burke's got a little leather-bound book in his hand here, <laughs> which... And the game, one of those nice little props I'd love to see if it is actually anything. Um, mm-hmm. It sort of reminded me of um, Sean Connor and his Grail Diary <laughs> from Last Crusade. <laughs> but um, Well, parts of the, like, the hero prop in that was actually did have pages in it. Um, I'm not sure if they actually said anything, but they did have pages and, and page inserts and all kinds of little doodads that were stuck into the book. They were for and, filming. Uh, for the filming Sorry? parts. That, that was for the filming parts, though. I don't. I think there was a lot of blank pages in between. I mean, oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of um, blank pages in there. Yep. But, yeah, um, we never get, do get a good look of the, uh, at the book Burke is uh, holding here. I wonder if it's a real book or if it's something that they use for, that same which the studios use for research purposes and just gave uh, book, or, I'm sorry, Burke to hold. Because when you sort of have a close look at it, sort of it has paper hanging out of it, like you'd have yeah. um, like scrap, but like a you'd have newspaper or other pages from a different book or something sort of <clears throat> attached to pages in there, and they're sort of starting to come out a little bit. Um, whether well, he's sort of bound. yeah, 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 it's leather bound. So whether it's gathering of no, his own notes on the animals. I think it might be. I think it might be just a notebook they might have grabbed. Yeah. So it looks. It kind of reminds me of my uh, own journal that I keep around for uh, journalistic purposes that I take notes in and stuff. Well, we don't get it in the film. Is you know, putting you on the spot a bit? Do we? Is there any explanation anywhere of what Burke's expertise is? Not exactly. They say that he's a paleontologist, but they never say what is. Hmm. field of paleontology is his concentration yeah. yeah i'd assume vertebrate paleontology yeah like like but... uh alan grant was a vertebrate paleontologist expert uh sarah harding is a behavioral paleontologist expert mm-hmm. i don't say what burke is but i assume he's a vertebrate paleontologist yeah yeah because he doesn't really of, of course, he's here denying the the fact that the t- Tyrannosaurus could uh, track him with scent. Um, mm-hmm. Because Until Sarah reminds him that uh, turkey vultures also sent up to, uh, what does he say here? Ten miles. miles. Ten miles. Ten miles. Yeah, yeah, because Sarah comes back with, don't bet on it, Tyrannosaurus got the largest uh, proportion olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record with the exception of one. And mm-hmm. yeah, I love here how Ludlow's just sort of starting to roll his eyes, and he's he's losing losing interest pretty quick. Because um, mm-hmm. this whole back back and forth isn't in the previous script. It's interesting that Burke would bring this up, because I don't think um, I don't think that Horner has pre- at in nine, by 1997 I don't think Horner had presented his scavenger T Rex uh, theory yet. Yep. But that was definitely one of the bases of it, was that T-Rex, like the vulture, like the turkey vulture, had a huge sniffer, and that the turkey vulture used it to hunt on carrion and any kind of rotting meat. And Mm. so that was Horner's basis for a lot of his T-Rex debate, or T-Rex scavenger debate, was that the T-Rex has this huge sniffer. He he was probably using it to track down um, and uh, scavenge carcasses. Yeah, yep. Yeah, just to be able to pick up that smell of decay from miles away. Mm-hmm. Because um, here we sort of, Burke thinks for a moment, then um, says, yes, yes, turkey vulture could send up to 10 miles. It's 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 sort of, I don't know if it's how much fact it is or if it's just trying to um, give our main animal character, the Tyrannosaur, a bit more a bit more oomph, a bit more awesomeness to say yes. Oh, not, no, only, sure. not only is it a big carnivore but it can it can smell you from a long way away <laughs> no it's definitely true is that uh t-rex had a it had a great sniffer i'm i'm not sure if it was the best in the 
in the fossil record besides the turkey vulture. Mm. But I only ask that, I only present that question because I'm not sure if somebody's replaced T-Rex in, uh, of that throne of the, but yeah, T-Rex is a very, very good sniffer. Yeah. And it's, it's one, it, again, it's one of the biggest things that sort of, one of the biggest issues the whole franchise has is by the time the next film comes out, there's been more advances in paleontology, what's been found. Um, mm -hmm. Like, especially now, there's still the push to see feathered dinosaurs in the films because that's what they actually had. But um, And being 1997, the, the Tyrannosaur may have been the, uh, yeah, the second largest sort of... Um, sort of area in its skull for scent sniffing mm -hmm. and that so um it's, pro it's probably changed now but that's sort of a thing of the time where they um they go off the best information i have sometimes they elaborate a little bit more and put a frill or venom in a dilophosaur and <laughs> do that sort of stuff but um ludlow takes a big swig from his flask here and uh, says this is all <laughs> this is all very thrilling but i say we push onto the village and um, as Ludlow sort of walks off to the right of the screen, we see the hunter still packing the trunk in the background. Mm -hmm. um, Malcolm suggests uh, they head back down to the lagoon where uh, their ship dropped them off. And um, Roland's sort of taking charge here again and do what? Sit out in the open next to a heavy used water source and hope your captain decides to come back for you. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have, to have a look and see sort of what, or how far in inland of a estuary or bay the water actually turns from being salty back to fresh water because where we seen the boat with Ian and Eddie talking about the rifle in the beginning, it's still sort of only just in. I reckon it'd still be salty. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how heavily used <clears throat> the water source point, would be. Though, for, for the most part, though, in estuaries and bays, the water is coming out and out from mountains and yeah. the rainy regions of a island and into the and into the ocean. So that water becomes kind of brackish in a way. Mm. It becomes like this fifty, not fifty fifty, but like a very half mix of um, salt and fresh water. Yeah, I suppose it depends where the sort of the high tide mark is. Um, sort of normally past that once. You don't get the inflows of salt water from the ocean. Um, you sort of get that equilibrium point. Mm -hmm. um, but then yeah, again, they might have had to. to they might have to, might have had to come inland a little bit too, just to find a, a, a shore to land on with the boat that wasn't rocky. Oh yeah, possibly. Mm. Now going back to um, Burke and Sarah debate here. Yeah. It's interesting that Horner would use that kind of um, olfactory sense in his debate because in 1993 he, uh, Horner and uh, Don Leeson uh, released their book The Complete T-Rex which uh, it questions T-Rex's hunters and uh, hunter status but it doesn't complete doesn't flat out say that T-Rex was a scavenger mm -hmm. which uh, Horner was famously known for saying it is interesting that in 1993, and this book even references Jurassic Park as being the most um, <clears throat> being the most uh, accurate portrayal of T. Rex there's been on screen. But it doesn't mention anything about his famous debate, and I wonder if that in 1997, if Horner was kind of verging on it, or if he was trying to like get Spielberg to say. Hey, um, T Rex may or may not have. So let's kind of tone down the chomping on regular dinosaurs and only let them chomp on humans, or you know? Because <laughs> in 1993, a lot of the basis of why Horner went with this, why Horner suggested the Spinosaurus replace the T Rex, was because. Horner was like, okay, this guy's a scavenger. He's not the king. He's he needs to be dethroned, you know. And that's yeah, exactly. And that's sort of what we'll talk and before with the knowledge at the time. Um, it also, if you've only got one, maybe two paleontologists as your um, as your resource, giving you the information, they're going to give you the information based on their discoveries, their opinions. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. People like, don't realize that science does have opinion in it. Yeah, yeah. 
Like, yeah. you, you only got to look at, say, climate change, stuff like that, where you've got a group of scientists that believe one thing, another group that believe another thing. Um, mm-hmm. If one scientist gets on the radio and talks about um, climate change, they'll talk about their beliefs and what research or what evidence they have. They won't. Mm-hmm. They won't talk for the greater good of just saying this is the this is the research we have, this is what it what it is. Um, like again, yes, Spinosaur at the time, Horner would have known that they haven't found a complete skeleton of the Spinosaur, and it was most likely more crocodilian than what we we see in the film. Mm-hmm. But he's he may have um, added his own research, and again, the film did sort of change the Spinosaur a fair bit from what it actually is, but whether that's Horner and his own research saying, well, let's do this, let's do that, or whether mm-hmm. um, he just gives them any idea, because that was one thing Spielberg said to Joe Johnson and that when they come into Jurassic Park 3 was, we make something to take over the T-Rex, we need a new king on the block. Mm-hmm. Which is just the escalation of sequels, <laughs> really. So. Mm-hmm. But still, even then, uh, I know that there was a very big team of paleontologists on the first Jurassic Park. There was Horner, Backer, John Gershaw, who recently just came out with more concept art, and Mark Hallett, yep. who also uh, helped do concept art. Plus, they referenced a wide variety of paleontologists when they uh, when they did the research. And unfortunately, they uh, still went. Spielberg still went with uh, Gregory S. Paul's Velociraptor naming for Deinonychus. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that Backer walked because of um, because of Horner, and Hallett walked because of the refusal of feathers. I'm not sure about Gersha. Um, and I do know that by the end of it, it was kind of just Horner. Yeah. And Horner was the only one brought back for the, any of the sequels, which is why we've gotten the sequels that we the science and the sequels that we have. Mm. Yeah. And that's that's one of the one of the age old dilemmas. You you put five intelligent people in a room together, they, they won't they won't solve world hunger. They'll end up fighting and let <laughs> and leave. <laughs> <laughs> Too true, man. Yeah. Yeah. But um we get Nick here, he's sort of, uh, no, no, the, the captain won't do that. He knows that um, the captain's too smart to come back, which we discussed that last minute. Mm-hmm. Um, Roland says, uh, then we head to the village, we might find shelter and we can call for help. Um, which is a little bit different in the pre-San Diego script. It's actually Roland that says, uh, more ironically, or sort of taking the piss out of Malcolm, but... Uh, he says, look, we have two choices. We can hike back down to the lagoon where we can sit there for two days in the open next to a heavily used water source um, while we're waiting for your boat to arrive or we can head to the village where we might find some shelter and we can call for help. Um, Malcolm replies to him, we'll never make it past the raptors, trust me. I have some experience in the matter. Roland replies, that may be. Um, but you weren't with me um, <laughs> at that time, which... Like Dieter before, um, sort of unbranching his weapon to say, yeah, we can deal with the Raptors. It's just the the pre San Diego script shows more of the where here. It's almost like aliens, military mm-hmm. military hoorah. We're here, we're uh, we can take down anything um, instead of uh, what the film sort of shows. A, a bit more even even pace between both groups. Mm-hmm. Um, the, one of the main themes across the franchise has always been the hubris of man. Yeah. How man has always been this kind of overconfident, cocky uh, people who just go around doing things without really thinking of whether it's a good idea or not. Mm. You know? Yeah, even sort of, even come Jurassic Park 3 as well, like, by the time Grant and the survivors get out of the plane, their sort of, Grant's main goal is to just get to the coast. We'll just search for Eric and the way he's going. <laughs> mm-hmm. As Udesky says, but... Um... Yeah, but it also it also too sort of shows that more of that um, Malcolm Malcolm experience in the Raptors before, where we've discussed, no, he really didn't um, in Jurassic Park anyway. The film where maybe they'll sort of hang it or using more from the novel there. But and then Roland does something weird. He walks over to a stack of crates and uh, mm-hmm. his rifle's just sitting there, not not on a not on a rag or anything, just sitting on the timber crate. Um, 
He, he picks it up and says, uh, Rex just fed, so he won't be stalking us for food. Which this annoys Malcolm greatly. He sort of storms ahead of the other group and um, follows behind him and says, I assume you're talking about Eddie. You might want to uh, show a little respect. The man saved our lives by giving his. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, none of that's in the original script either. Um, but uh, Roland tells him that... Um, you're breaking your hearts, and let's get this movable feast underway. Mm-hmm. Um, which, that's that's what happens in the script. Of course, in the film, we get um, him reply to Malcolm that uh, his troubles are over, but we don't get to see that this minute. Nope. Um, it's also something that um, we haven't really talked about before. They must have... The hunters must have seen the Trenosaurs attack and the, the M-Class, or at least Eddie being killed, because as far as we know... Um, or as far as the gatherers know, he went over the cliff in the M class mm-hmm. because there's no unless they found a shoe or something up in the <laughs> in the in the brush in the camp, um, they didn't see the Eddie died. They just seen no. the trailer than the M class go over the side. So the hunters must have seen the Tyrannosaur attack and and come in once they um once they left the area. Yeah, I mean they have all those guns. You'd think they'd be trying to shoot them. You know? So like watching this guy die. Yeah. Even, I don't know how you go just firing in the air trying to make as much noise as you could to scare him off. I don't think that would work with a <laughs> Trenosaur um, like you would with other yeah. other predators. But I mean, guns would. I mean, uh, Roland has those two big slugs that he plans on shoving in the T-Rex's head, you know? Well, that's, yeah, and I was going to bring up that next, next minute. He's here in the territory with the Trenosaurs. He wanted the buck. The buck was just there. Was was he afraid someone was going to jump on him and tell him to stop? Or, mm-hmm. uh, like they're about to leave the area and um, they're sort of in survival mode here, where they got to go and call for help. But mm-hmm. um, you'd think he's had his. He'd just say, "Right, you head that way. I'll catch up to you in half a day. I'm going after the Rex while it's in the area." But then again, it's sort of as we discussed with Eddie not being able to get the the um. Lindstrad air rifle out, sort of, we can't have people shooting dinosaurs as much as we do sometimes. <laughs> All right. Anything else on 67 you want to bring up before we end it for the day? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I think it's interesting how during this conversation you can see them, you can see the uh, actor's breath. Mm. Now, this is a closed studio. They're not outside, so I wonder if they, like, turn the AC up or um, if it's just the, because the studio lighting isn't being as as direct and heating up the set, so it's getting cooler in the set. But it's a great piece of continuity because you can see the breath in the night scenes throughout the um throughout the uh, whole night scenes. Well, and that's it. Like chronologically, we've just seen them all standing in the torrential rain as they um mm-hmm. reach the top of the cliff. So everyone's soaked. We see yeah. a couple of times here where. Ian's holding Kelly. She's wrapped in a woolen blanket to try mm-hmm. and get warm. So it, it makes total sense. Where whatever time in the day or time in the evening this is, um, their bodies would be cold and they'd be sort of trying to warm up and have that condensation. Their breath. How they've achieved this on the studio? Because this this too this camp set never actually had any rain on it. So I'm guessing it's a dry set. Um, yeah. So. You'd think if anything, it'd be warmer in there. The matter they'd turn the AC down. Yeah, really. Or it might be CG too. <laughs> I doubt it. They'd go through, through that trouble just. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Good point. But yeah, that's food for thought. Yeah. All right. We later see it. Uh, we later see it again in. Um, in we later see it again in uh, the worker village set, and I thought it was interesting because that was an exterior set filmed in like. Uh, early November, mm. so that's why we that's why we see the breath in that scene. You know, well, I just when, thought it was a great piece. Of, I just thought it was a great bit of continuity throughout the movie. Yeah, and when we get to their camp later on, when the Trenosaurs attack again, sort of same. You're saying back at that Eureka, um, if that was done in the Eureka Creek, or if it was done here on this camp set, because it's got the same sort of that pebble. One, that one was, yeah, that one was a set. Yeah. But um, but as you said again, like night shot, and um, they got the breath. Mhm. So, oh, very good. All right. All right, guys. 
Let's get the hell out of here. Contact details are on the website, thelostworldminute.com. You can email feedback to thelostworldminute at gmail.com. Facebook, The Lost World Minute. Twitter, at The Lost World Minute. And Instagram, The Lost World Minute. Easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, very easy to All remember. Right. <laughs> uh, David, thank you for joining me for this recording. You're welcome. And uh, we'll be back. I've been Brad. I'm Dave. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. Goodbye. Talk to you later. Bye. It is absolutely imperative that we work with the Costa Rican Department of Biological Preserves to establish a set of rules for the preservation and isolation of that island. These creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And if we could only step aside and trust in nature, life. <laughs> <laughs>